Well, good morning. And it was uh, unexpected how loud that music was, but welcome to the uh, Footlight Broadcast. My name is Brian O'Kelly. I will be your host for today's adventure, and uh, I'm not sure if the audio is coming through the way it should, but I hope so. Um, I had a little bit of trouble getting it rolling this morning, so hopefully um, everybody can hear me well, and if somebody puts in the comments whether there's a weird echo or anything in this, that would be helpful because I'm concerned that that might be the case. Um, so anyway, welcome to the Footlight Broadcast. My name is Brian O'Kelly. I will be your host for today's adventure, broadcasting from the forest in Cottage Lake, Washington, just outside of Seattle. And um, here we go. Uh, today's uh, episode, or, or lesson, if you will, will be on the Book of Romans. And uh, we are going to get started through the Book of Romans today. Today will be an introduction slash overview. And then we will uh, dive into this book over the next several weeks, um, probably maybe even three months it will take us to get through Romans. And it will be, as best I can, a detailed and very in-depth study. If you are not a person who wants to really dive into the content of the Bible, you're probably not going to not going to enjoy this very much because um, it's going to be detailed and we are going to dive right into the into the meat of this thing. A uh, couple just housekeeping things. Um, if you have uh, questions, comments, disagreements that you want to air voice, talk to me about, uh, call the message line that we have. It is um, 866-988-8311, uh, and uh, that should be on the screen for you to see now. You can also email me at brian the fo- at thefootlight.com and then Facebook and uh, other messages and so on. Um, I will do my best to answer your questions, get back to you, um, depending on volume and time, but I, I won't ignore you. I will get back to you eventually. Um, so that's the, the upshot of that. Now let's get into this study of Romans. And so, uh, you know, why, why should we study this book at all? And what is it about? Let's, uh, let's just start off with a quick word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, uh, giving it to us and for instructing us. We thank you for your Holy spirit that helps us to understand your word and, um, make it real to our hearts, Lord, and help us to act on the information that you want us to have. In Jesus' name, amen. So, okay, so Romans, why study this book? Why why be concerned about Romans? You know, a lot of people actually don't like Paul very much, and we're, we'll talk about that as we go through. Hey, Daryl, nice to see you this morning, and hopefully somebody just put a, a note in there. Let me know if the audio is okay, because I'm. it sounds a little weird from where I'm sitting, and I, I had to change some things. I'm not sure if it's all working, so put a note in there if, if it sounds good, uh, or okay at least. Um so anyway, this, this book of Romans uh, is really, uh, outside of the Gospels, has had more impact on Christianity and Christendom than any other book, uh, in my view. And a lot of people say that, that, that Romans is really kind of uh, Paul's lengthy presentation. Uh, it's really not so much a letter, thanks Daryl uh, for letting me know that, it's really not so much a letter, but it is a complete survey of Paul's theology. Um, but it's not, a, I shouldn't say complete, it's a, it's, a, it's a broad and deep and detailed, but it's not, uh, doesn't include things like um, the Eucharist, communion. It doesn't include the resurrection. There's really no talk of the resurrection in Romans. There's no talk of eschatology, of the end times in Romans. But what Romans is, is replete with is information about Christian living. And so we are going to jump into this a little bit. Now, Again, why study this book? So I'm going to give you some history of things that have happened. We'll talk about Paul's um, mission here with the letter. So in the summer of, of 386, uh, there was a, a young man, and he was in the backyard of a friend, and he was weeping. He knew, this man, that, that his life of sin and rebellion against God was, in fact, killing him, that it was leaving him empty. Um, you know, and a lot of people have this, you know, what is it all about, right? What is it all about kind of feeling that we, that we live with? And so this man was sitting and he heard some children playing and they, they were playing a game and they called out to each other these words, take up and read, take up and read. Now the young man thought that God had a message to him through the words of the children. And he picked up a scroll laying nearby and opened and began to read and It said this, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is in Romans 13, uh, 13 and 14. And he didn't read any further. He he didn't have to. Uh, Through the power of God's word, this was Augustine, uh, 
And Augustine had the faith to entrust his whole life to Jesus Christ at that moment because of that verse, or so this was his testimony. Now, later on, so I mean, pretty significant, Augustine probably had more impact on, on theology than anybody else, and it was this, these two verses in Romans that were the motivation for him to pursue his Christianity wholeheartedly. Now, in, in 1513, uh, there was a monk who was lecturing on the book of Psalms in seminary, but he was not content internally, right? He had this internal turmoil, and he came across Psalm 31.1. It says, Thy righteousness deliver me. And the passage confused him. How could God's righteousness do anything but condemn him to hell as a righteous punishment for his sins? And this was Martin Luther. And he kept thinking about Romans 1.17, which we'll cover today, which says that in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. And so as it is written, he through faith is, uh, is righteous and shall live in Habakkuk uh, 2.4. So this guy went on, Martin Luther, and he, he said it, he pondered day and night until he grasped the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby, through grace and sure mercy, he justifies us by faith. Therefore, I felt myself to reborn and have gone through open doors into paradise. This passage of Paul became my gateway into heaven. Martin Luther was born again, and the Reformation began because of his reading of Romans 1.17. This is a significant book that we should study. Now, in, in May of 1738, there was, a, there was another guy, a failed minister, and he was a missionary, and he went uh, unwillingly to a tiny little Bible study uh, where somebody read aloud from Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. And this failed missionary said later, while he was describing the change which God's works, works in the heart through the faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine. This was John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist uh, faith, uh, Methodist you know, uh, denomination. John Wesley was saved that night because of uh, Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. So Romans, is, I mean, it's had a big impact. The Reformation, Augustine, and even the Methodist Church have, have really sprung from this. So I want to share with you some of the um, things people have said about Romans, just a few quotes. Uh, Martin Luther said this, it's the chief part of the New Testament and the perfect gospel, the absolute epitome of the gospel. Um, there's a guy named Philip uh, Melanchthon. Uh, he said Romans is the compendium of Christian doctrine. Uh, John Calvin said, when anyone understands this epistle, he has a passage open to him to the understanding of the whole of Scripture. That's kind of a big deal, right? Uh, Samuel Coleridge, Coleridge, an English poet and he's a literary critic, said of Paul's letter to the Romans, it is the most pro profound work in existence. <laughs> Sounds like it'd be worth studying, right? Uh, Frederick Godet, a 19th century Swiss theologian, called the Book of Romans the cathedral of the Christian faith. I, I would think if we want to know about the Christian faith, we really need to understand Romans. Uh, Campbell Morgan said Romans was the most pessimistic page of literature upon which your eyes ever rested, and at the same time, the most optimistic poem to which your ears ever listened. And lastly, Richard Lenski wrote, Romans is beyond question the most dynamic of all two New Testament letters, even as it was written at the climax of Paul's apostolic career. Okay, so where did this book come from? And so on. Uh, it's almost universally agreed that Paul wrote Romans from the city of Corinth. Uh, and he wintered there on his third missionary journey. And you can see this uh, description of this in Acts 20, verses 2 and 3. And, uh, you know, based on Romans 16.1 and 16.23, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.14, a variety of commentators picked the date of writing because of these things anywhere between 53 and 58 A.D. Okay, so it's about, you know, 20-some-odd years after Jesus when Paul wrote the book of Romans. Excuse me. Now, he had been a Christian preacher for about 20 years at this point, right? And on his way to Jerusalem, he had three months in Corinth, and he didn't have any pressing duties. Uh, he perhaps thought maybe this was a good time to write ahead to the Christians in Rome. And he was planning to go to Jerusalem, and on his way to Spain, he was going to visit the church in Rome. Now, um, as he endeavored to go to Rome, the Holy Spirit warned him about the peril awaiting him in Jerusalem. 
What if he were unable to make it to Rome? Uh, then he must write them a letter. So he had this idea, the Holy Spirit warned him, if you remember, he's going to go to Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit warned him about danger there, which of course ended up happening. He was going to be imprisoned there. And so he thought, well, you know, the Holy Spirit warned me, I better write a letter to these guys in case I don't make it, right? Now, because of this, Romans is totally different than all of the other letters Paul wrote to the churches. Okay, most of the other churches have a couple things in common. One is that they focus on the church, its challenges, and its promises. Okay, this book focuses mostly on God and his plan of redemption. Another distinction uh, in the book of Romans compared to the other letters of Paul is that all the other letters of Paul were to churches where he had uh, relationships and experience. He knew the people, but the church in Rome where he's writing this letter, uh, these are Christians he doesn't know. He's never been there. He doesn't know them. He's never met them, okay? And so this is very different. Now, some people say that the church in Rome was was founded by Peter, and uh, this is one of the Catholic traditions, is that Peter was the first bishop of Rome, that he founded the church in Rome, and uh, it's well and good that people have a tradition. There's not a shred of evidence that that's true. The church uh, appears to have been in existence in Rome well before any time that Peter ever traveled there. And uh, in fact, at the time of this writing, Peter would have been in Jerusalem as near as we can tell. So uh, we know that that this letter was prized by the Christians in Rome. We know that. Uh, Clement of Rome in, in 96 AD, uh, in his letters, he shows a ton of familiarity with Paul's letters. Um, now, Clement may have memorized it, um, and the reading of it became uh, apparently virtually part of every meeting at the Roman church. They would get something out from this letter and talk about Paul because Paul had written it just to them, right? Now, um, there's a, a number of scholars, uh, F.F. Bruce, one of them, uh, believe that an edited version of Romans uh, without the personal references in chapter 16 was distributed pretty widely among the early churches kind of as a summary of apostolic doctrine. Now, I said that this book is a book focused on God, and it really is. The word God occurs 153 times in Romans, 153 times, an average of once every 46 words, more frequently than any other New Testament book. And in comparison, look at the frequency of some of the other words used in Romans. So 153 for God, law 72, Christ 65, sin 48. Lord, 43. Faith, 40. So it's twice as often as the word law, okay? And literally, I mean, almost four times as often as the word faith. Romans is a book focused on God. So let's jump right into this uh, book here, and let's just jump into the first verse, and let's just go, and we'll talk about the meanings of these things as we go on, I'll do my best. And again, if you have a disagreement with me, feel free, message me, call, whatever. Um, so here we go. Romans chapter one starts, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Okay. So what is a bondservant? What does this mean, bondservant? Well, if you Google it, you look it up in Wikipedia, it just basically says it's a slave. And there's truth to that. A bondservant was a slave, but they were a different kind of slave. You know, slaves were just like in, in chattel slavery in, here in the U.S., they were bought and sold. But there was another kind of slavery. It was more like uh, serfdom or feudalism. You know, in, the, in serfdom and feudalism, uh, somebody owned the land and you got to work the land, although you never possessed it. And a lot of the crops went to the owner of the land, but you got to keep some. You lived a subsistence life that was, in many cases, not a bad life. It was a life of work and a life of pay, but not a life of ownership. And, of course, not ownership of yourself either. But that's very not too sim dissimilar today than people who go to work, don't own a home and all that, and they, they basically end up without tons of assets, and it's kind of hand-to-mouth, right? For a lot of people who are living paycheck to paycheck, if you will. And so uh, paycheck to paycheck and serfdom isn't all that different. Now, in, in serfdom, you're not a slave. You're not owned. You can't be traded and sold. And so a bondservant in the biblical reference is very similar to this. This is somebody who was a slave, but 
a slave voluntarily. Okay, in those days, you know, it was it was challenging to make a living. If you didn't own lands, if you didn't own flocks, if you didn't come from a wealthy family uh, and didn't have any assets, I mean, there was no welfare, there was no social safety net, and not everybody. Uh, Sabrina, to answer you, I, I like the New King James, uh, and that's what I use most of the time, uh, but I, I don't really have a dog in the fight on this. Most Bible versions are are pretty good. Um, but I, I like the New King James, and, and that's what I use, but not because I think it's better. Uh, I just am comfortable with it and used to it, uh, to answer your question. So this bond servant concept, you know, um, the idea was that if you didn't have a way to go, you didn't have a, a there wasn't a, were no regular jobs. You didn't go down to, you know, the factory and fill out an application and get hired. If you didn't have your own land and flocks to tend to, you had to tend to somebody else's land and flocks. If you didn't have your own profession, you ended up being an apprentice and working in somebody else's business, right? Or somebody else's livelihood. And so we've all had, uh, I hope, employers that we really liked. I have one now in my regular day job where, you know, I really, I love these guys. I care about them. I I want the best for them. And they have been really good to me. And because they're really good to me, I am super loyal to them. I'm, I'm, I protect them. I care about them. I protect their business and their interest because they've been so good to me. Right. And this is the concept of a bond servant. This is someone who is kind of uh, giving their life energy to someone else. And they were uh, committed to this in a way that they were, if you will, effectively owned and directed, although they couldn't be traded and sold. Okay. And these terms of service, you would submit yourself and say, well, I'll, I'll work for you for the next five years as your slave. I'll do whatever you tell me to do for the next five years. And at the end of the five years, uh, you're going to give me my freedom and you'll give me some assets so that I can stay free. Okay. Now the five years would expire and they'd come to you and they'd say, you know, Hey, Brian, you've, you've put your term of service in and you can now be free. We'll let you go. And this is where I would go up to him and I would say, you know, um, that sounds great. I would love to be able to be free, but I'm looking out at the world and I'm seeing all the stuff out there and how it is. And I'll tell you what, I, I really like it here. I think I just want to stay here. I think if I if I stay with you, my chances are way better than a lot of other things I could do. So I would just like to be a bond servant to you for life. I don't ever want to go anywhere else. I want to stay with you. I want to be part of your household. And many of these bond servants really became like, uh, if you will, uncles or brothers or extended family members, right? Because then that's why they had decided to commit to life for life to this person. Now, the way you would do it to demonstrate you were a bond servant is you would go to the doorpost of the home and you'd go on the inside, not on the outside, on the inside of the doorpost. And the person would take their earlobe and put it up to the doorpost. Okay. And they would drive a spike or a nail through your earlobe into the doorpost to symbolize a permanent connection with that household. And then afterwards, when that uh, spike was taken out, there would be an earring put in. And that way people would know when they see the, the man with an earring that he was a man who was a bond servant who had given himself voluntarily to somebody. That's what a bond servant was. Now, what is an apostle? Back to our, to our verse here, Paul starts off here. Paul, a bond servant of Christ, Jesus Christ called to be an apostle. So let's dig into that word. What is an apostle? What does apostle mean? Apostle is the word, uh, the, the uh, Latin word is apostolos, okay? And what apostle means is a sent one, an authorized one. Uh, we might think about it like an ambassador, okay? When an ambassador goes forth, uh, we send the U.S. ambassador to, you know, England or, or Australia sends their ambassador to, you know, Japan. What an, an ambassador does is speaks officially, authoritatively, on behalf of the organization that is the sender. So an apostle is one who speaks authoritatively because they were sent by Jesus. So this is an apostle. 
An apostle is an authorized person sent by, and just as when an ambassador speaks, it's the same as if the president or a head of that country were speaking. When an apostle speaks, it's the same as if Jesus were speaking. There's no difference because Jesus has authorized them to speak for him. If you will, it's almost like a power of attorney. Okay, when I, if I have power attorney over your affairs in life, I can sign my name and it's the same as if you signed your name. This is what an apostle is, is a sent one who is authorized. Now, I don't know of any living apostles today. I'm not saying there aren't any. I don't know of any. The, as near as I can tell, the last apostles we know about were the ones that we have biblical records from. If we had an apostle today who could demonstrate that they were an apostle, as Paul says in other places, by the signs of an apostle, uh, perhaps we should listen. Uh, But I don't know of any such person on the scene, and I don't know that there would be a reason for them to show up. Okay, so verse 2. Actually, one more thing. Called to be an apostle separated to the gospel of God. Now, separation is the concept of holy, right? Separated, set apart, set aside, and to the gospel of God. And so what is the gospel of God? And one of the controversies about Paul is some people will say that Jesus had one gospel and Paul had another gospel, that they they really weren't on the same page. These guys, Jesus and Paul, didn't agree. Jesus came preaching the kingdom and Paul came preaching grace is what people will tell you. Now, most of these people who say that are what they call dispensationalists. And they will say that the that Jesus came preaching the kingdom and that because the Jews rejected the kingdom, the kingdom was postponed. And so Paul came along and preached the gospel of grace and it was a different gospel waiting for the kingdom later. Now, uh, I have been challenged by, uh, with this by some people in the past. Hey, Brian, you know that Paul wasn't agreeing with the gospel. Come on, I'm Jesus and Paul, they're not even on the same page. And so I, I endeavored uh, to do an in-depth study of every major theological concept or position that Jesus took or that's taken in the Gospels and every major theological concept that's taken by Paul or promoted by Paul, and I can't find a dime's worth of difference. There's no difference, not, there's no daylight between Jesus and Paul, none whatsoever. So uh, this gospel of God is what he's going to unwrap throughout the rest of the the book. Now, so verse 2, verse 2 we jump into, and it says, which he promised, the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And so this is the gospel which was promised before. And what Paul's saying is, this is not a radical idea. This gospel I'm going to share with you is not brand new. It's nothing different. If you know the scriptures from the past, you would know because, verse 2, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And so it's it's all there. And Paul's saying that there's nothing I'm going to tell you that you shouldn't already have seen coming. Okay? Verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So um, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, what does our Lord mean? When we say Jesus is our Lord, what do we mean by that? What, What does it mean when you say someone is your Lord? This is what Paul's unpacking in the concept of a bond servant. It's the identical thing. I am committing to my life, my life to you as my Lord. I am committing that I will take direction from you. I am committing that I will take whatever you say as my Lord Jesus, and I will do it. I will, I will do exactly what you say, and I will not even question it whatsoever. This is the concept of a Lord. This is the concept of that Paul is saying, I'm doing what Jesus says no matter what. This is where the concept of our Lord. Now, you hear some people say that you can make Jesus Savior without making him Lord. I've been, well, I got, I got saved, but I'm still trying to make him Lord, you'll hear some people say. And I, I personally don't believe this is possible, okay? You're not a follower of Jesus if you're 
not a follower of Jesus. And the whole idea of Jesus being your Lord is that you are a follower of Jesus. Uh, Sabrina, in the comments uh, here on Facebook, for some of these you on Rumble, Twitter, or other channels, uh, or the, the footlight.com website, Sabrina says uh, Christ appointed Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles, and she's exactly right, and we're going to get into that here in just a minute. Um, so back to our verse here, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So this is declaring Jesus' humanity. Jesus is, was fully God or fully man and fully God, right? He was a hundred percent human being, no different than you and I, according to the flesh. Verse four, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness. Now we're, so Paul's declaring his human nature and his divine nature. Both are being declared in this verse and by the resurrection from the dead is, uh, how this was promised, right? Now, uh, so Jesus' two natures are declared in this verse. Now, going on, if we move on and look at uh, verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among who, whom you are also called of Jesus Christ. So grace, I, I think most people understand grace as unmerited favor right? This is an unmerited, you didn't do anything to get it. Uh, grace is the idea that um, you will be forgiven and you don't deserve it, okay? Uh, mercy is where you have a punishment coming and the punishment is withheld. So grace and mercy are similar and related, but they're not the same. Grace is the idea of unmerited favor. Through him, verse 5, through him we've received grace and apostleship. So the apostleship is an unmerited favor, right? For obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And again, obedience to the faith, lordship, salvation, okay? Now, how do we receive grace? How? Simple, we have to, we have to basically say, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, and I'm going to trust you for everything. I'm going to trust you for my future, for my salvation, for my finances, for my relationships. I'm going to trust you for absolutely everything. And this does not mean that you're going to live a perfect life, but what it does mean is that as you stumble, you have an answer. You don't intend to stumble. You have a trajectory for your life. You've made a decision to follow Jesus. And then when you stumble, the unmerited favor is there. Verse 7, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Paul was a Roman citizen. He had never been to Rome, but he was a Roman citizen. And the reason is he was born to a Roman citizen, okay? And then he's writing to this church that he didn't know. He didn't establish the church. There's no uh, historical evidence that the church was established by Peter, like we said. So Paul is writing to all who were in Rome. And by all, he means, of course, the church there, right? Beloved of God means God loves them, right? And called to be saints. What is this called to be saints? There are some... Uh, denominations. I, I think uh, the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, Orthodox Church, and maybe some others who have this concept of a saint as different from the everyday Christian. And this is a distinction that I don't think Scripture makes, and it's not a distinction that Paul is making here. As he's saying called to be saints, what he means is called to be part of the family of God. Saints are the parts, are the family of God. And so this is what he means. So who called them? They're not called by people. They're called by God. And what are they called for? Everywhere the Bible tells us that we are saved for good works. Okay. And so what we're called for is to be part of the church. We're called by God to be part of the church for good works. Okay. Next, uh, grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Paul's first expression to the Roman church is gratitude. And their faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. That's kind of a big deal. The church in Rome was making an impact way beyond Rome. This is a huge compliment to them. You guys' faith is such a big deal that people are hearing about it everywhere, and I'm grateful for it. Okay, so Paul is happy that they're, that they're promoting the gospel and pursuing it. Verse 9, 
Uh, Paul says, uh, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit. Um, oh, yeah, I got it. Sorry, I, I jumped ahead. Uh, I had the slide wrong. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making a request, if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. So God is my witness. We all say this. And what this means is that when, what does it mean when you say God is my witness? What, what do we mean by that? Well, we use it as an expression to tell people that we're telling the truth, but it means a little more than that. God is not just the witness of the external. He's the witness of the internal, right? God is the one who knows exactly what's going on with you. And so for someone who's a believer, someone who's a, a preacher like Paul to say, God is my witness is, would be a convicting thing if it weren't true, right? Um, so this is what God is my witness. Now he says, whom I serve with my spirit. What does this mean? Serve with my spirit. I don't know about you, but sometimes I have difficulty serving with my flesh. Sometimes I have difficulty doing what I know I should do. Like Paul says later, uh, chapter eight, the things I know to do, I don't do. The things I don't do, I find myself doing. This is the flesh. But what does he mean when, I, when he says, I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son? I believe what Paul means here is that I'm, I'm committed in my spirit and my trajectory to serve Jesus. I don't have any plans on it being perfect, but I am committed to serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. Now, when it says here uh, that he says that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. And people, some people say, well, without ceasing, was Paul never not praying? Well, I, I don't think that's what he means. I think what he means is that his habit was prayer. And his habit when he prayed was to pray for this church. This, as I understand it, is what I mean. And then, of course, he, he puts in making a request if I can. He wants to go visit him, right? Now, verse 11, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. Now, uh, he wants to see them, which, of course, he, he never has, right? That he wants to give them a spiritual gift. And I, I did a whole series on spiritual gifts uh, a couple months ago. It's there if you want to dig into that deep. But the point is here, he says, some spiritual gift so that you may be established. The spiritual gift would help establish them in their faith. And what, what does that mean? Established. When we see a sign outside a business established in, right, what, what is it telling us? It's telling us where it began and that it still stands, right? So what he wants is that their faith to be established and strengthened, if you will. Establish, one of the parts of the root words of it is stable, right? And so what Paul wants is for their faith to be stable. And verse 12 here says, that is that I may be encouraged together with you by mutual faith. So he wants to be encouraged by seeing them receive the gift and being established, and they will be encouraged, and they'll be encouraged together, is the idea here. Um, now, verse 13, now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now. So again, he's not sure if he's going to make it. He's writing this letter, letting them know, I'm, I'm trying to get there, guys, just haven't been able to make it happen yet, right? That I might have some fruit among you also just as among other Gentiles. Uh, I am both a, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as, in me, as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. And so he, what he's starting to say here is, look, you guys are Gentiles in Rome. I'm going to come here uh, with the gospel. And just like other places where I've come with the gospel, I'm hoping that it's fruitful there. I'm hoping we see the same kind of results there. And he's saying, when he says, I'm debtor to both Greeks and barbarians, wise and unwise, what he's saying is, I've been going everywhere and I'm talking to everybody and I got an audience wherever I go, you know? And so I'm in debt to these people because they're hearing me, they're hearing the gospel go forward. And so verse 15, so as in, 
as much as in as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome also. By Rome also, he means, look, I've been doing this in Greece. I've been doing it with the barbarians. I've been doing it all over, and I'm definitely ready to do it in Rome. Verse 15 says, I am ready. And this, if I, if you will, seems to be Paul's motto. Okay. Now, what is a paradigm shift? And I'm going to talk about what Sabrina brought up here, that, that Christ appointed Paul to be an apostle of the Gentiles. So I want to give you an idea of a paradigm shift and what this means in case you don't know, and probably you do, but uh, it's a good setup for what we're going to talk about here. There's a, a man named John Maxwell, who some of you may have heard of. John Maxwell is a preacher evangelist and does a lot of uh, leadership training and teaching. Let me grab a little water there. Thank you for your indulgence of that. Um, so John Maxwell tells a story about going to New York city and he was there to speak at some, you know, conference. Cause that's what he does. He does all this public speaking stuff. And so Maxwell is on the subway on the way to his destination and it's early morning cause he's getting there early and he gets on the subway on the train. And not long after there's a man who gets on with a couple of kids and it's early in the morning. He's kind of wondering, what are these kids doing here with this man this early? And the kids are pretty wound up and they're, they're really kind of making a lot of noise and they're just being, you know, I guess little boys or little girls, whatever kids that is how the story goes. And uh, Maxwell's trying to concentrate. He's about to go give a talk. He's looking at his notes and he's getting frustrated with this noise. Uh, you know, and finally he says to the father, Hey man, could you just, you know, control your kids a little better? He's frustrated, right? And what the man says to John Maxwell is kind of in a fog almost, which was part of Maxwell's frustration as the guy hadn't been seeming like he was paying attention to his kids. And the, the guy says to John Maxwell, he says, Oh, well, um, man, I'm sorry. Um, we just came from the hospital and, uh, their mother just died. And uh, not, I guess we don't know what to do, and I'm sorry I wasn't paying attention. Well, imagine the impact on John Maxwell. Do you think John Maxwell was still frustrated? Do you think he was still wishing he could focus more on his notes? No, John Maxwell, because he's a, a good man, right? 180 degrees change in a moment to now shift to comforting that man and engaging with him and praying with him. This is a paradigm shift. Now, there's an important paradigm shift that Paul shares with us in the next verse, and that's why I bring it up. Okay, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The Greek is the Gentile, right? Rep Greek represents the rest of the world that are non-Jewish. 17, for, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so, Paul, there's even a, a famous Christian song, uh, I'm Not Ashamed, right? I think it's Newsboys. Um, so, verse, you know, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He's not ashamed because he knows it's the power of salvation, the power of God to salvation, okay? For Jews, for Greeks, for everybody. And Paul is the one preaching to the Gentiles, just like Sabrina said. He was appointed an apostle of the Gentiles. We'll see more references to that as we go forward. Verse 18. Um, uh, for, uh, I'll stop on one more thing. Uh, not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation. And this is so important. When you're sharing the gospel with people, remember, the gospel is the power. The word of God is the power. It's not you. You don't have to be great. You don't have to be awesome at sharing things. You don't have to know everything. The word of God itself is powerful. It divides as sharp as a two-edged sword, right? And so all you need to evangelize effectively is a Bible. Share the word of God with people. Let it do its work. Uh, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. This is where it gets difficult, guys. This is These are some hard verses coming up. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and righteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. Um, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, um, 
sorry, trying to do too many things, too many things here. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. Okay. What is natural law? This concept here, verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. Okay. Um, what does this mean? What is natural law? Have you heard this term, natural law? This is the concept, if you will, of fair play, of honesty, of protection of the innocent. If you've ever read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis does a pretty good job of digging into this idea that everyone knows you don't throw old ladies down the stairs. No one needs to be taught this, okay? And so the question we have to ask is, does natural law exist? Is it just something that everyone knows? Now, my own belief is the answer to that question is in the affirmative. It's a yes. And this is what it means when God says we're created in the image of God. It doesn't mean we look like God, okay? It doesn't mean that, that God, in my case, is, you know, 5'10 and balding, okay? What the image of God means is that we have the image of him in who we are. And this is in our sense of fair play, honesty, etc. So some people say that this is not anything to do with God. This is just instinct and the development of um, evolution, and it's, it's created uh, in people this um, knowledge, if you will, that this is all socialized, if you will, that, that being honest, being fair, uh, protecting the innocent, these things are just socialized. They're learned behaviors, um, or that they're instinct. Which is it, right? Well, let's talk about this, okay? In instinct, if you have someone in great danger, Okay. And you see the person in great danger and you have two instincts. One is to help and the other is to flee. Okay. Now the challenge is that sometimes that idea of helping, okay, causes you to be in peril. And so that's the third thing. It's where you act against your own interest in the interest of someone else. This is the opposite of instinctual behavior. Instinctual behavior is always self-protective, okay? The idea that you would, you know, put yourself at risk, sacrifice yourself for someone else is counterintuitive to instinct. Now, social code is learn from social code. Let's talk about this. Now, just because we learn things from others, from our parents or so on, doesn't mean that the people who teach it to you invented it. And it doesn't mean that man invented it at all. For example, we've all been taught mathematics by a teacher or by parents. Well, they didn't invent it. They didn't invent mathematics. God invented mathematics. Mathematics are law, a law of the universe. They always work every time it's tried. Okay, so you can teach something to someone without having invented it. And so the idea that, that uh, something has to be invented by man that morality and these kind of things are invented by man doesn't have to be so because mathematics isn't invented by man, yet men know it and men teach it. Morality, I believe, is the same way, and it's revealed here that men are without excuse. And of course, men and women, mankind, right? Now, is there a different kind of morality? Is there a completely different upside down morality than the one we have? Is there something that's totally inverse where stealing is good, uh, murder is good, assaulting people is good? Um, is, Is there some kind of opposite morality than that? And some people say things like, well, what about the, you know, uh, the third Reich, the Nazi Germany thing? What about, um, Islam that's beheading people? What about these, these, um, different, uh, viewpoints in the world? Aren't those different kinds of morality? Well, this is the argument that, that the moral realists make, right? That there's no absolute right or wrong, that uh, good or evil is a matter of personal or cultural preference. Now, this without excuse thing, what do we do about this without excuse thing? The reality is it's sin that condemns. It's not God that condemns. It's not religion or church that condemns. Sin condemns, okay? So when we talk about these alternate societies or alternate types of morality. 
Let's talk about this. this is, you say, well, mor- Christian morality or the morality that you might think is natural law is is just learned behavior. It's socialized behavior. And well, if that's true, you would have societies that are completely opposite. And people say, well, you know, our morality in the West is, uh, you know, to have one wife. And in the Middle East uh, or other places, it's to have more than one wife. Isn't that a different morality? It's a different set of rules, but it's not a different morality because even in that setting, no one has the view that you can have whatever wife you want whenever you want and that no one has any say about it but you. And there's no view in in that world that you can have another man's wife at will. Okay, this is not an alternate reality. It's the same reality that who you have intimate relations with or close relations, not just, I'm not just talking about, you know, sex, but who you have close relationships with is not a matter of doing it with anybody anytime you want. There is a sense of who belongs to who and whether or not you have a right to that. The same on private property, your personal property. There's no society in the world ever that didn't have the idea that what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours and and you can give me what is yours and I can give you what is mine, but I can't take it from you without your permission. This is morality. Even in the most backwards, oppressive cultures in the world, they don't hurt the innocent. They protect the innocent. People define innocent differently. You know, in, in, uh, you know, Iran, where they're, you know, beheading someone for being a Christian, uh, they consider that to be a crime. And so they, in their view, are not uh, abusing someone who's innocent, right? And so the, the same morality that exists in all of mankind is what we're talking about when we talk about natural law. This is the without excuse. Now, how do we get to this? How do we get to this place of natural law? How does that happen? Well, everything we evaluate, everything we evaluate except ourselves, we evaluate externally. It's outside of us. The only thing we evaluate that can evaluate that's different than that is inside of us. In other words, if you and I are appraising or, or evaluating something that's external to both of us, we probably both have or can access similar information. But if you want to evaluate the condition of my heart, or I want to evaluate the condition of yours, or the innermost thoughts of your mind or mine, you can't do that with someone else. The only thing, only place you can do that is yourself. Okay. So in determining whether or not the universe, if you will, is more than we observe, uh, we do suspect that it is. In fact, man has always come to this conclusion. Okay. And some of these ideas about the origin of our um, morality, if you will, are better than others. And we don't need to believe that all these other religions are uh, invalid or that they're all equally valuable. Some are more nearly right than others. Let me give you an example. Let's just say that we use the Christian example of not to murder. Well, not to murder is in every religion. None of them have the concept that murder is okay. So on that one issue, these other religions are right, right? And so we don't have to believe that they're completely wrong. What we can believe is that the internal revelation of God to all man has led to the same conclusions throughout all of society, okay? Now, man is divided into two major divisions here, okay? They are the atheists or naturalists, the people who believe there's no supernatural, and then the theists, the people who believe there is something supernatural, And on the supernatural side, they break into a couple of categories, a few categories. Um, Pantheists. Pantheists are the people who believe that God is kind of beyond good or evil. God is expressed in all. The universe is God, and your goal is to be in harmony with this force. They're theists. They believe in the supernatural, but differently than us. There are other theistic religions that believe that God is good. Jews believe this. Christians believe this. Muslims believe this, the Baha'i believe this, the Druze in Lebanon believe this, the Zoroastrians believe this. They believe that God is good and that because God is good, he takes sides and expresses a preference for goodness. That's another view of God, right? And a bunch of religions have that. 
Of course, atheists will tell you that if God is good, why is the world so unjust, right? And uh, we get back to where we started, because if justice is just a personal preference, if it's just my own idea, then the argument that the atheist makes collapses, because they're going to say, well, the world is unjust. And you can respond, according to who? And they'll say, well, according to me in consensus. And then you say, well, where did that come from? And you get back to every man is without excuse because they don't even know why they think that murder is unjust and rape is unjust and all these other, they don't know. They don't know that is an outgrowth, not of socialization. It's an outgrowth of the natural law, the imago Dei, the image of God in everyone. Okay. One more view that, that happens in the world here, and that's dualism. Dualism is, is uh, two equal forces, yin and yang, good and evil, right? Well, this is all fine and good if it were true, but we do observe that one of these forces is superior than the, to the other, okay? Once we understand that we have a superior to inferior setup, yin and yang evaporates, okay? So this, these are kind of the major worldviews, and this is under, in my view, the heading of natural law or men are without excuse. And so all men are without excuse. And what they do is try and construct something that works, uh, that makes sense for them. Um, verse 21, let's jump on Keep going in our study here. Verse 21, because although they knew God, so we're talking about, right? They knew God. All men know God. They know what is true. Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they came, became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Why are we corruptible? We're corruptible because of free will. We're corruptible because of free will. So, you know, man made a golden calf, right? Uh, in India, they, you know, the cow is sacred, right? Uh, people have worshipped dogs, okay? Um, I mean, it's just, you know, people worshipped uh, animals, people worshipped the sun, people worshipped all these kinds of things because professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the corruptible God and they worshipped the creator, not the creator, right? And so um, this is the main lie of Satan. The main lie of Satan is you can be like God. God's no big deal. You can make God into who you want him to be, if you will. Uh, God hasn't said anything that you can't contravene. Verse 24, therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So what is this worshiped and served the creation or the creature rather than the creator? Let me, let me give you an idea of some, some groups that are on the scene today that, that kind of fit this description. How about the animal rights people? Now, I'm not saying that anybody should be in favor of mistreating animals. I'm an animal lover for sure. But the people who want to make animals equal with people, the people who want to give personhood rights to an elephant or a hippopotamus or a, or a you know, a, a tiger or whatever it is, they want to give these creatures human rights. They want to treat them as equal. Quote, worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Not just people who worship the animals in the old days, but people who worship now the creation. The creation itself is where the value is. This extends into environmentalists. Environmentalists are just practicing the oldest religion. Now, they would never tell you that, but in the end, it's earth worship. Earth worship. This is what environmentalists are. They are worshiping. You heard the idea of tree huggers, right? They love the trees. They love the environment. They love the earth in the same way that we are supposed to love God. Now, to me, as a Christian, it's a fool's errand to run to love the earth. The earth is going to be destroyed and burned up for, uh, you know, 2 Peter 3, 2. Uh, the, the earth will be destroyed and all the elements in it will be burned up with a fervent fire. Uh, what about um, 
the uh, pro-choice abortionist people? Uh, are they worshiping the creature rather than the creator? This is the same thing. That's the elevation of man's prerogative, the elevation of our decisions, our wants and needs over the wants and needs of God, serving the creation self over the creator. And then, of course, you have the whole, uh, if you will, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll movement, right? And, you know, this is where all that matters is if it feels good, do it. You do what you want and, you know, follow your own interests, and that's how you succeed, right? And that's how you live your life, worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Okay, let's go on. Uh, let's see, I think I have one more here and switch the screen. Not as easy as you think, guys. Um, so for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men committing with men what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Now, I'm not going to elaborate a ton on that. It's pretty self-explanatory and you know what it's talking about. And uh, I hate to say it, but partly so that we don't get banned on, on Facebook, I'm not going to dig deep into that, but you do know what this is talking about. And some people would say that this uh, penalty receiving in themselves or in their flesh, some would say the penalty of their error, which was due. I remember back in uh, the eighties when people were saying that this verse was uh, referring to the HIV virus. Um, now pe some people might say it's relating to uh, this monkeypox virus. Uh, those are positions I don't hold. Um, I think this receiving in themselves is um, receiving in the flesh basically means that you let me figure out how to elaborate on this. Um, salvation, I believe, is not only your ticket to heaven. Salvation is, the way I would say it, uh, I am saved, I was saved, I am saved, and I'm being saved. Salvation is an ongoing process of my connection with Jesus as he improves me. And so this receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, if we ignore God and do what we know not to be true, we will not move closer to God, closer to salvation. We will move further the other direction because the, ultimately in the end, the main difference between a Christian and a non-Christian, a, a servant of God and a non-servant of God is whether or not we follow after what God says. And if we're not following after what God says, there's no reason that we should expect to have blessing in our life, to have God's reward, right? Now, verse 28, uh, and this will wrap up the chapter and a little commentary after this verse, and we'll be done. Um, we'll do chapter two and beyond next week. Uh, verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God. Paul's just on a rant here, right? Violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to their parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Wow, right? What a list, right? Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. A debased mind filled with all unrighteousness. And all of these things, sexual immorality, covetousness, wickedness, maliciousness, wanting to hurt somebody, envy, I want your stuff, right? Or I want to be like you, wish I was like you. Murder, obviously, you know, no more evil than this. Strife, deceit, lying to people, causing fights, evil-mindedness, planning bad stuff, whisperers, telling, you know, secrets, gossiping, backbiters, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be two-faced to you, right? Haters of God. I want to touch on one of these things here that's important. And because it doesn't get enough attention, in my view, in Christian circles, and that is violence. God hates violence. He hates violence. 
let me say it again, God hates all of these things, and especially violence. And at the end of the list, it says, deserving of death. So why am I talking about violence? Well, there's a lot of uh, complaining in Christian circles about the violence in Hollywood and the violence in our entertainment. And just to be clear on this, I'm talking to me, me, this guy, I'm guilty. Okay. I have enjoyed the violent movies and stuff that Hollywood puts out as much as anybody. In fact, at one point I was really proud that I owned all of the DVDs of Clint Eastwood movies, all of the DVDs of Sylvester Stallone movies. I had all of the Mel Gibson lethal weapon movies on DVD. And I really enjoy the car races and the shooting. I do. I do. I wish I didn't. It's wrong. Now, since that realization, God hates violence. And the last part of that verse, not only do they do the same, but they also approve of those who practice them. The Bible says, whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, meditate on these things. Doesn't include violence. So I, I just want to say that I'm guilty of perpetuating that kind of entertainment by giving it my attention, by giving it my money, and by giving it some of my affection, and even telling other people about how, quote unquote, good these things are. So, uh, you know, that concludes chapter one of Romans. And next week we'll get into chapter two. Uh, I'm sure uh, it would be weird if I got through this much uh, commentary and there weren't some disagreements or, uh, you know, maybe things you want to add on. i uh, love to hear from you in the messages. Uh, email at uh, the footlight, uh, brian at the footlight.com, uh, messages on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Rumble, YouTube, etc. And then, of course, there is the uh, the phone line you can call, which is, uh, what is it? It's uh, 866-888-9311. Uh, you want to leave a message or whatever. And um, you can visit the footlight.com website and support the show if you want. Uh, I'm just going to leave that all in God's hands. If he wants us to have money to advertise and promote, great. If he doesn't, great. No worries. Uh, Lord willing, see you next week, the 28th, 6 a.m. Pacific. Thanks again 